want to uh, speak to you about, um, to, well, it, it's called Reality Check, Part 1, Understanding the Times. We need to understand, church, what we're dealing with, what we're going through right now. Because this has affected every one of us in some way or another. Some people, it's affected their minds, uh, you know, bringing fear, bringing anxiety, panic, all of those things that come with it. But the Bible says, it's not on the screen, but the Bible says in First Chronicles chapter 12, and I love this verse, that the sons of Issachar, they had an understanding of the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. And if there was ever a time that the church needs to know what we're to do, it is now. It is now. This is brand new territory we're going into. It really is. And I'm not looking at 2021 as a year of dread and a repeat, you know, a repeat of 20, no, 2020. No. I'm looking at 2021 as a year of advancement, a year of great reward, a year of increasing of territory, expansion of all that God has equipped us and prepared us for in 2021. Hallelujah. And we've got to know, it is essential, we've got to know what it is that the church is to do in this hour. We don't live like the world does. We don't look at things the way the world does. We don't think about things the way the world does. We have a, a much higher power, and that is Christ. Glory to God. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing in these days. And he hasn't been taken by surprise by everything. I fully believe, right from the beginning, even till now, that God is orchestrating something powerful in this whole pandemic, shutdown, lockdown, everything else that is, you know, a, a part of what we're going through right now. And so I know that you most likely have heard in the news now that there's a pastor in Edmonton, Pastor James Coates, who at this very moment, as far as I'm aware, is in prison. And I haven't been following the story. And the reason why is because God just has not impressed upon me to do that. And I don't have any opinion about it. I've heard different things uh, by chance, coming across certain things on YouTube or whatever. You know, that the reason why he's in prison, some have uh, reported that Pastor Coates is in prison because he refuses to stop preaching the gospel. I don't know if I can really believe that or not, because that's not happening here in Canada. It's not. If anything, it would be more so along the line of refusing to align with the restrictions of the government and health and everything else, that kind of thing. That's, that's what I'm thinking. But I, what I want to say to you this morning is that I am not his judge, and Pastor James Coates does not answer to me. However, we will, both of us will answer to God. We will answer to God. He will answer to God for his ministry, his life, his his actions, his words, his deeds, I will answer to God for my actions and my words and my life and my ministry. I will answer to God. And I want you to see on the screen, because the Bible is very clear on that, in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 13, it says this, Paul writes, Why do you judge your brother? And I will not judge my brother. If he is a true born-again pastor, he's my brother, okay, in Christ. It doesn't mean that we agree. It doesn't mean that he's wrong or right. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong or right. He will be my brother, and God will deal with all the areas that need to be dealt with, you know, and, and, and sometimes God deals very seriously with those areas because Jesus said, to whom much is given, much shall be required. In other words, if God is going to use you in a greater place of position in the kingdom of God, you can expect that to come with a much, much higher accountability, that if you mess up, if you blow it, there's going to come some consequences from the hand of God as a result of that. And I speak for myself as well. So I'm not criticizing him, and I am not justifying him. Get that clear today. I'm not criticizing him, and I'm not justifying him. His actions do not represent the entire body of Christ in Canada. There will be those that are all on the bandwagon calling him a hero and, and a martyr, and then there will be others who will be upset with his, what he's doing. That's the way it is. That's the way it is in the, in the kingdom, in the body of Christ. And so Paul says, why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11, it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow, yes, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. Verse 13, 
Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But rather, now you got to get this. Resolve this, Paul says. Do not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Isn't that powerful? You've got to really get a hold of that. Don't be a stumbling block to a fellow believer. All right, don't be a stumbling block. Very, very, very serious. How do we do that? How, do, how would I be a stumbling block to somebody? I'll tell you how. By my wrong actions, by my wrong attitudes, by my wrong words. That's how. I could be a stumbling block in those very ways. By my wrong example. And, and I need to be an example in the body of Christ because God has put me in a position that way where I have to be living my life uh, where there is nothing secret going on, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I have to be living as an open book in front of everybody to see. And I have to be willing for people to accuse me. I have to be willing for people to misjudge me. It, it's all part of the whole process of what God is doing. What, what is God doing in this? Well, I'm going to tell you what God is doing in this. He is maturing us, saints. Come on. He is maturing us. He doesn't want us to be little babies. He wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He wants us to grow in his heart for this world that he created. He created the world. He, he loves the world. Hallelujah. And he loves his church. And God wants us to grow up in those things and become stable, become established, become spiritually mature. And there was a day that the disciples came to Jesus and they were all upset. And they said, Jesus, Jesus, look at that guy down there. He's, he's casting out devils and he's not one of us. And we went and we told him that. We said, you stop doing that. You're not one of us. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, my. <laughs> Talk about pride. <laughs> Talk about the party spirit. No, he says, and we told them Jesus. And I'm sure they thought they were doing a great thing, right? That the Lord would be so proud of them. Good, good job, guys. Good job, you're, you're watching over us. That's great. Jesus didn't do that. He said, look, whoever's not against me, what did he say? Whoever's not against me is for me, right? So in other words, Jesus was saying, you have no right to do that. Now, I appreciate your zeal. I appreciate your you know, wanting to protect. You have no right to do that because he is not against me. So you need to consider him as one of us. And can you imagine that poor guy who was simply doing what he felt God wanted him to do? You know, casting out devils, you know, whatever else he was doing in the kingdom of God, by the power of God. Can you imagine Christ's own disciples coming to that guy and telling him, stop, stop, you've got no right to do that. You're out of line. Can you imagine how he must have felt? They were a stumbling block to him. And there's a strong warning with that. When we are a stumbling block, yes, we might have zeal. Yes, we might think we're doing the right thing. We're sincere. We're, we really want to do what's right. But, but that's why we've got to grow spiritually so we can understand the difference between what is right in God's eyes and what is right in our own eyes. Because sometimes what we think is right is completely wrong. And the disciples were completely wrong. They were out of line. And Jesus had to correct them on that whole matter. I want to, I just want to share with you, it's not on the screen, but there's a very serious verse in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, and it simply says this, that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. There is a rebellious spirit today, and it's not only out there in the world, which you would expect it to be, but it's also inside the house of God. It's inside the church. There is a rebellious spirit that has come in. And it is disguised, be careful now, I'm warning you, be careful now. It's disguised as liberty, it's, it's disguised as, as, as having my freedom, you know, having my rights. And yet there's a spirit behind it that is called rebellion. And it's a very serious thing because it can infect the body of Christ. It can infect those around. And that's exactly what the devil loves to do with that kind of a spirit, rebellion, is as the sin of witchcraft. And so we need to be aware of that spirit of rebellion Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, didn't he? He said, if my kingdom was of this world, he said, my followers would fight. He's not expecting us here and now because his kingdom is still coming. He's not expecting us right here and now to rise up and fight. Rise up in the face of the government. Rise up in the face of other churches and other pastors. and Rise up and, and, and fight. No, that's not the, that's not the spirit of Christ. That's not the heart of God. 
for this very time. God's heart is just the opposite. That we are to be peacemakers. That we are to put our faith and trust in God. That we are to speak words of blessing and peace. Words of healing. Words of life. Glory to God. And I don't believe that the church ever advances or, or is setting forth a good example for the kingdom of God when we become belligerent, when we become that, that, that spirit of rebellion, that spirit of, of defiance, you know, in your face. No, that's not the spirit of Christ. We need to remember that. There are certain laws in our society today that seem to be an infringement upon our rights. And, you know, we're living in a time when we're hearing that so much today. Well, I've got rights, you know, I've got constitutional rights, I've got freedoms. Of course we do. So what? <laughs> so what? Not as Christians. Jesus said, take up the cross and follow me. He said, forget the world. He said, forsake the world. In other words, Jesus was saying, look, at, if you're going to take up the cross and be my disciple, then that means you're going to die to yourself. You're going to die to your so-called rights. You're going to die to your so-called freedoms. And you're going to let God live his life in you in such a manner where you can, where you can be that example in this world that is quickly, quickly falling apart, far, falling farther and farther away from righteousness and anything that is decent and moral. You and I can be that. Julie prayed that this morning as we were having time together with the Lord, and she prayed that, and she said, Lord, it's amazing. You call us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. That's what we are, church. That's not just a figurative speech. That is the reality. That's exactly who we are. If this church was gone, if the church was taken out of the world right now, all hell would break out in a, in, a, in a manner that we've never seen, and we think it's bad now, just wait till the church is gone. Then you're going to see in the book of Revelation what's coming. But right now, we are making a difference as a church, as long as we keep our actions and our attitudes, our motives right, our words right, as long as we keep all of those things right, then God is going to use us to be that example to the world, because the world needs that desperately right now. And there are certain laws that seem to be very unreasonable in our society. Unreasonable. For example, Fred, he drives a bike. And uh, it's the law for Fred, for him to ride his bike, to have to wear a motorcycle helmet. That's a law. Whether that seems reasonable or not. And I'm sure there's times when he wishes he could just ride that bike down that country road without any helmet on, with his hair flowing in the wind. <laughs> Sorry, Fred, I owe you one. <laughs> but listen to this. Okay, listen to this. Fred does not have the right to ride his bike without a motorcycle helmet. He doesn't have the right. There are 228,000 motorcycles in Ontario. Last year, 27 motorcycle fatalities occurred in Ontario. 27, all right, out of 228,000. So that means one motorcycle driver out of 8,000 uh, ended up in a crash and dying. One in 8,000. So that tells me that it seems pretty reasonable that Fred could ride his bike without a helmet and he'd be fine. It doesn't matter if something's reasonable. It's the law. You get it? It doesn't matter if it seems reasonable. It's the law. So keep your eye on Fred. <laughs> we don't have a right to drive through a red light. I mean, there's been many times because... When I was uh, working on the job, I would get up very, very early and I'd be, you know, approaching a red light and there'd be no traffic at all. I was the only one on the street. And uh, there was one particular time I was on my way to meet my son, Pastor Matt. We were meeting for coffee on a Friday morning and have some prayer together. It was very, very early in the morning. I remember approaching this intersection and the, the light turned yellow and I thought, well, I... There's nobody around. I looked around. There wasn't a single car around. I thought, why should I have to stop? <laughs> you know, and, and I kind of drove half through a red light. Yeah. And you know, I never thought a thing about it. Didn't feel bad about it or convicted about it. It seemed reasonable to me. Why would I stop? There's nobody here. Well, the next thing you know, I see these red lights in the rear view mirror. And I get pulled over, and, and I was guilty. <laughs> I broke the law. It didn't seem reasonable, but I broke the law. And, can you imagine me saying to the police officer, officer, you don't understand. There was nobody there. It's not, re it, it, it's not, it's not, it's, it's reasonable that I went through. And, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Have a good day. <laughs> well, it didn't happen like that. I ended up getting a ticket. And so it doesn't matter whether it seems reasonable or not. It's the law. The same thing applies with seatbelts. I'm sure there's times, you know, especially if you're going to make a little quick trip to the store. It's just down the road a block away. 
you don't bother putting your seatbelt on because that's just kind of a, you know, a restriction and it's not necessary, it doesn't seem reasonable just for going up law, but it's the law. It's the law, and there have been times when God has convicted me for that very thing. And I've, yes, Lord, and I've got that seatbelt on, even though I was just going a block away. Sorry, dear, it just came up. <laughs> but it's the law, and whether it seems reasonable or not, we have to keep the law. I want you to listen to this statistic. Nine million vehicles in Ontario right now, there are nine million vehicles. Every year, ten people die from not wearing a seatbelt. So that means that one person in Ontario for every 900,000 cars. That seems pretty unreasonable, doesn't it? To have to wear a seatbelt when only one person will end up dying in a car accident from not wearing a seatbelt out of 900,000 people. And yet, it's the law. What I think you understand what I'm trying to say here. It doesn't have to make sense to us. We don't even have to like it. It may seem totally unreasonable. It may seem crazy. Come on, are you kidding? And yet it's the law. What are we to do as a church? What are we to do as salt and light in this earth? How are we to respond? How are we to act? It's not reasonable. And then we talk about the coronavirus because there's all kinds of statistics on the coronavirus, especially on social media, and people that are so against uh, you know, the restrictions and the regulations, people that are so against that, they like to bring up these statistics that only, you know, 1.1, you know, person out of 99% or 100, you know, all of these statistics. Well, I want to share something with you right here. Consider these stats for COVID-19 in Canada. There are 38 million people living in Canada, 38 million. There, are, there have been 858 1,220 cases of COVID-19, which is 3% of the Canadian population, right? 3% of Canadians have, have, have ended up getting the virus, all right? Now listen to this. Out of that number, 3%, out of that number, there has been 21,865 deaths that have occurred. That is 3%. Of those that have come down with COVID-19, only 3% have died from it. And they like to throw that statistic around, like, what's the big deal? How unreasonable? Why do we have to go through all this? Right? Why do we have to wear masks? Why do we have to sanitize? Why do we have to distance? Why do we have to have lockdowns? Come on, church, listen to me this morning. Because whether it is reasonable or not, it is the law right here and right now in Canada. And as Christians, we are to obey the law. As Christians, we are to be uh, you know, above everybody else when it comes to maintaining that standard of, of, of being peacekeepers, of, of submitting to the authorities that are over us, just as the Bible tells us to. Because these laws are for a purpose, and the reason why is for protection for ourselves and for others in our society, whether we like it or not. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. But we've got to keep it. It's the law, even when it seems totally unreasonable. And so regardless of our personal opinions, because we all have a personal opinion, regardless of that, what does the Bible say? That's what it comes down to. What does the Bible say? Well, I'm happy to tell you it has much to say about what I'm talking about this morning. Romans chapter 13 on the screen, 1 to 2. Paul writes this, Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. That's the government. For there is no authority except from God. So God establishes governments to maintain peace, to bring protection into society. And he says, and those that exist are instituted by God, verse 2. So then, the one who resists the authority, okay, the one who resists the authority, no, I'm not going to bow, I'm not going to give in, I'm not going to submit. Those that do that are opposing God's command. And those who oppose God's command will bring judgment upon themselves. Now, I think you would agree with me, that's quite a serious passage of Scripture. And so the only time that we are to oppose the law of God is when it goes against God's law. That's the only time that Christians can, with, with a moral conscience, you know, in, in the sight of God, we can defy the laws of the land when it conflicts when it goes against when it opposes God's law and we see that played out in Acts chapter 5 when 
when the authorities came to Peter and John and they said, you've got to stop preaching that name of Jesus. We've already warned you. You're done with it. You're done with it. And, and they threatened them. In fact, they beat them and everything else. And, and, and their answer was simply this. Look, at whether you think it's right or not for us to listen to you, that's up to you. But we will obey the Lord. We will obey God. That's exactly what they said, and that's exactly what they did. It wasn't a matter of, it wasn't a matter of, of, of what we're experiencing here right now, trying to keep everybody safe, trying to bring peace to our society, trying to fit in to the point where we, we, where we, we don't become a stumbling block to somebody, especially somebody who's not saved. That's such a serious thing. That's not what the apostles were dealing with. They were dealing with authorities that were telling them, stop preaching when God told them, preach. And God is telling his church today, preach. And it doesn't mean, we have to, it doesn't mean that we preach with anger and, and resentment and that kind of an attitude. It means we preach with love. We preach with patience. We preach, we preach with goodness of God. Because it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Mm -hmm. By the way, Brian, did I remember you this morning? I forgot to mention you, Brian. You're a man of faith and fire. You're a man of faith and fire. In God's eyes, you've got the holy fire in you. And you're going to preach. And you're going to end up going, no, you're going to end up going out east. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and so here's, here's the point I'm trying to make this morning. Are the police coming in right now? in our service to arrest me or to arrest Pastor Matt. Are they doing that? No, they're not. And if they did, they'd have to get past Grant. Right, Grant? You'll stick up, right? Okay. All right, so here's another passage from 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 to 3. I, I'm sharing this because you need to understand this is the Word of God. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then Paul says in verse 2, he Kind of breaks it down for kings. Those are the authority. For kings, the government. For all that are in authority. Why? So that we may lead a quiet, there it is, and peaceable life, salt and light, in all godliness and honesty. Now look at what he says. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is what pleases God, what I'm talking about here this morning. And I'm not judging one single person. I have my own opinion about things. Of course I do, as you do. But I'm not going to judge anybody. God will judge. Mm -hmm. I got enough on my own plate to take care of myself. <laughs> you know. So, so this is what I'm saying here this morning, that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. And I want to just be very clear that I'm very appalled as well by some of the mockery that is, uh, that is against our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, I don't agree with everything that Justin Trudeau, you know, as a as a prime minister, you know, the laws and, and and things like that. I don't agree with all of that. Of course I don't. But I respect the man and the office. He is our prime minister. He is exactly who the Lord is saying here in these verses. He is the authority that God has raised up. Whether we understand that or not, God will give a nation the kind of leader that they want. That's very clear. We see that in the book of uh, 1 Samuel with King Saul. And so right now, Justin Trudeau is in the office over all the land of Canada, the authority. And it really bothers me, when, especially when Christians mock him. And I saw it on Facebook just a few days ago, and it really bothered me. I don't respond to stuff on Facebook. You know, I just shake my head. And, but, you know, this one really bothered me, you know, because it was very insulting. It was very degrading. It was very profane coming up about Justin Trudeau, coming from who I understand to be a Christian. I thought, I, oh my goodness, this is so wrong. And I, I, I just left a comment. I said, you know, we ought to pray for our Prime Minister Trudeau. We ought to pray for our churches. We ought to pray for our nation. And I left it at that. And the person who posted that sent me a like. You know, so we don't have to get, you know, that kind of a wrong, rebellious spirit. Because we don't like something. We don't agree with something. No, no, no. We are the salt and the light of the earth, glory to God. We are the ones that make the difference spiritually in our nation. We make the difference spiritually in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our, in our, in our uh, you know, the area where God has placed us, the workplace and homes. We are the ones that bring that salt and light, glory to God, that is activated in the nation, that brings peace, and that brings the blessing of God. We want the blessing and the favor of God upon our nation. And it's up to you and I as God's people to begin to declare that over our land. And stop 
stop moaning and groaning about the coronavirus and about the lockdowns and about having to be at home and this and that and it's so inconvenient and this and that. And I, I'm not trying to make light of it because I know some people are extremely lonely right now. Some people are suffering terribly right now as a result of that. I know that. And I'm not making light of it, but I'm saying that you and I have the authority. We have the authority over that. As we submit to the authority, we have an authority in the spiritual realm to make a change, glory to God. And that's what God wants to do this year in 2021. It's going to be a year of great change, outpouring and expansion what God is going to do. Hallelujah. And I believe that. And then there's another passage. The last passage is in 1 Peter chapter 2. Verses 13 to 16, look at what Peter writes, for the Lord's sake, <laughs> there we have it again, for the Lord's sake, submit to those who have authority in this world, the king, who is the highest authority, and the leaders who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. It is God's will that by doing good, you should stop foolish people from saying stupid things about you. Do you know what Paul, uh, Peter is saying there? He's saying this, he's talking about unbelievers, he's talking about worldly people that don't know the Lord, that don't know the truth. You know, they're still blind, you know, they're still blind, they're still bound up, you know, by sin. And he's saying, live your life in such a manner that the foolish people out there will have nothing to accuse you of. Because right now, with all these news reports that are taking place, not only out in Edmonton, but also right here in our own city, and in other places as well. The world is watching, church. The world is watching. They're watching to see how we, who claim to be, you know, so much higher, so much better, like we've got the truth, you know, we've got it all together, you know, and, and, and it's no other other religion. It's just us, you know, it's Christ, it's Christianity, which it is. And the world is watching to see if what we're uh, saying is how we're living. And there is a huge, huge difference between the two in certain churches that the world is watching and they have every right in their own understanding to to uh, to bring accusation against those that claim to be peacemakers that claim to be gentle and humble and I'm not saying that they're not I'm saying we've got to be careful how we present ourselves because the world watches on and we can so easily be a stumbling block which we will end up receiving correction very severely from God if we go down that path and get caught up in that whole Spirit of rebellion. That's why we have to guard our hearts against that. And how do we do that? We lock ourselves away with God. You want to talk about a lockdown? Get alone with God. Get into God's presence. Let Him form in you the Spirit of Christ. So that when you're walking in these situations, when you're dealing with people that are so upset and angry, that we can bring peace, glory to God. We can bring truth. We can bring God's perspective into the situation and not our reaction or our emotions and what other, other people are doing or saying because God is bringing forth his church in these last days. And so he says, you should stop foolish people from saying stupid things about you. And then he says in verse 16, live, look at, live as free people. And that's exactly who we are. We are free, glory to God. We are free. In our spirit, we're free from sin. The Bible says sin shall not have dominion over you. We are free from our past. We are free from judgments of other people, you know, accusations, things they say and do against. We're free from all of that. Glory to God. That's what Paul is saying here, or Peter. Live as free people, but look, don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. In other words, become rebellious. Become anti-this and anti-that. God's not looking for anti-this and anti-that. God's looking for those that will speak life and, and that will speak, uh, you know, a positive word of confession of God's truth. Hallelujah. Because church, what we speak is going to bring forth something. We're somewhere with somebody. What we speak and what we declare, let's declare life. Let's declare truth, glory to God, that sets people free. He says, live as servants of God. Even Jesus himself submitted to the authorities of his day, even though he was free. And it says in Matthew chapter 17 that there was a time when him and Peter were walking along and, and there were those who said to Peter, doesn't your master pay the temple tax? And the temple tax was 
a one-time offering once a year that they would collect for the temple to, to maintain you know, uh, the, the needs of the temple. And so they would collect this tax once a year, and it just so happened to be that time. And, and they said to Peter, doesn't your master pay the temple tax? And Peter said, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he probably wasn't too sure what the answer is, yeah. And Jesus later on said to Peter, Peter, he said, we're children of, of God. We're children of the kingdom. We are exempt from the tax. That's what Jesus was saying. We are exempt from this tax. And then Jesus said, but so that we don't offend them, he told them what to do. Go get the tax. He told them how to do it. You see, that's what I'm talking about, not being a stumbling block. Jesus did not maintain his rights as the son of God. I'm not going to pay that. Are you kidding? What are you talking about? The temple? I am the temple. That temple is me. I'm going to pay. He didn't do that. He said, yes, we're going to pay it. Why? Because we're not going to offend them. That's why. That's what has to be in our, in our attitude, in our mind when we're dealing with people. Lord, is this going to cause an eruption, an argument, a needless argument, a division? Or is this going to bring healing and unity? And if it's something that, you know, that's going to bring offense to people, unnecessary offense I'm talking about. Sometimes the word will offend people. Yes, it will, the truth. I'm talking about evaluating the situation. Lord, will this bring peace or will this bring division? And if it's something that's going to offend somebody and cause a rift that is irreparable, then I suggest you take some time to think about that. Because we are peacekeepers in this world, hallelujah. And Jesus submitted himself to paying that tax because he didn't want to offend. F.B. Meyer, I love F.B. Meyer. He's one of my favorite writers. He said this. He said, we must often, as Christians, we must often conform to requirements that seem needless. All right? Just like what we're going through, right? Seems needless. But, he says, because of the effect of our example on others. That's what it comes down to. What kind of an example are you personally displaying to people around you with your attitude, with your actions? That's a good question, isn't it, for all of us today? And so it's time that Christians become spiritually mature in these matters instead of acting like the world. Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3. He says, my friends, you're acting like the people of this world. That's why I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people. You're like babies as far as your faith in Christ is concerned. I had to treat you like babies and feed you milk. You couldn't take solid food. He's talking about the Word of God. Talking about the deeper, stronger things of God's Word. God's nature, His character, His heart, the kingdom. And he says, I can't feed you with solid food. And you still cannot, verse 3, because you're not yet spiritual. You are jealous and you argue with each other. That is a divisive spirit that was in the Corinthian church. Paul recognized it and he dealt with it. You've got to stop this because you're dividing yourself. And Jesus said a host divided cannot stand. If you want your church to thrive, if you want your church to expand and grow strong and become a real uh, blessing to the community, you've got to deal with division. That's what Paul was saying. Stop envying one another. Stop being jealous. Stop arguing amongst one another. He's, he was saying that. You're, you're, you're acting like children. And he says, this proves that you're not spiritual and that you're acting like the people of the world. And then Hebrews chapter 5, exactly along the same line, the writer says this in verse 12, by now, he's talking to the church, by now, you should be teachers, he says. But once again, you need to be taught the simplest things about what God has said. Just like a little child, you know, I just got a little teaching the ABCs, you know, little nursery rhymes, you know, things like that. Jesus loves you. And that's what Paul is saying. You know, you still have to, that's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying, that you still are, have to be taught the simple things about what God has said. He says, you need milk instead of solid food. People who live on milk are like babies who don't really know what is right. Solid food is for the mature people, spiritually mature, who have been trained to know right from wrong. Trained to know right from wrong. Trained by the Holy Ghost. Trained by the Word of God. Trained by the gifts that God has uh, that God has ordained and instituted in the body of Christ so that we could grow together to become spiritual giants of the faith, glory to God, loving one another, bearing one another, you know, ministering to one another, praying for one another, and going forward together, hallelujah. 
I want to close this message this morning by just sharing with you very quickly seven reality checks for 2021. Reality checks right now for this year. Number one, the word of God is truth. The word of God is truth. This is your bearing. This is your anchor. This is your compass. This is your compass. Anything that goes against this, cast it out. Ignore it. Reject it. This is your compass. Hallelujah. This is your life. Anything else will be a poison to you. It will poison you. It will rob you. So reject it. Number two, prayer. Reality check. Prayer works. Prayer works. That's the foundation. That's the foundation in your life. Prayer. Prayer. Glory to God. Number three, God is shaking as he said he would do in the last days. He said, I'm going to shake heaven and earth. He said, I'm going to shake all that can be shaken so that that which remains cannot be shaken. That is the church. That is his church. Glory to God. His church can never be shaken. Praise the Lord. I'm going to do that again. Never be shaken. Hallelujah. Come on, join me. Never be. <laughs> Number four, God is exposing secret sin. I think you all know that. And I don't want to be mentioning names. I don't even want to, I don't even want to read up about it. I don't. I don't. It bothers me. But God is doing that in this very season, this hour in which we're living. God is exposing secret sin, especially among church leadership. Uh, especially those that God has been dealing with year after year after year, and they continue to reject and resist the Holy Ghost to the point where Julie was saying this morning, where is the conviction anymore among Christian leaders? And it's true, and eventually God has no other choice but to expose it for the sake of the body and for the sake of his name that is being blasphemed among the heathen. When it, whenever a leader is exposed, and it's happening you know, so much in the past year, leader after leader after leader has been brought down because of secret sin. And so that's what God is doing, not because he wants to, but because he has to. Number five, praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, Lord, do it, I pray, God. He is pouring out his spirit in these last days because he is empowering his people. We are, we are empowered by the Holy Ghost. Not by might, not by power, but by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And then number six, Jesus is coming soon. The hour is at hand. Jesus said, watch and pray because I am coming soon so that you do not lose your crown. You don't lose your reward. Praise God. He is coming, church. It is an urgent time in which we are living today. And then finally, the uh, last reality check is the church cannot, cannot, cannot be defeated. Hallelujah. The church cannot be defeated. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, upon this rock, I will build my church. I'd love to see the devil try to tear it down. He can't. He can't tear down the church that Christ is building. Hallelujah. And he says, I'm going to build my church. And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. And then he goes on to say, and I've given you, church, the keys of the kingdom. That is your authority. Come on, start using your authority. Start standing up to the lies of the enemy. Start standing up to temptation when it comes suddenly in front of you. Stand up to those things. Stand up to those things with the authority. Of pull the strongholds down. Set the prisoners free. Loose the bands. Open the prison doors. Glory to God. Let the captives come out into their freedom that you've experienced. Hallelujah with the authority that God has given to you, with the keys of the kingdom, that whatever you loose on earth shall be loose, loose love, loose peace, loose joy, loose the blessing and the favor of God. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Bind the demonic strongholds. Bind the lies. Bind the confusion. Bind the anger. Bind the hatred. Bind the division. And all of those things that go with it in the hour in which we're living today. We're going to see a church triumphant rise up out of the ashes. Out of the ashes. Glory to God. God's going to burn everything. The church is going to rise up out of the ashes. And we're going to set people free. Hallelujah. Because this is the year of outpouring 2021. Stand with me, please. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. I just want to pray with you this morning. Oh, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. 
Glory to God. If you need a fresh touch from God this morning, I just want you to put your hand up to the Lord today. Hallelujah. Don't worry about other people. We're all, we're all here together. Glory to God. Put your hand up. You need a fresh touch from God. You need a refiring in your spirit. You need a rekindling of the Holy Ghost. You need a fresh vision of what God is doing for your life, in your life, through your life. Heavenly Father, today, Lord, I believe each and every one of us need, God, what I have just expressed. God, we need fresh oil. Amen. God, anoint us with fresh oil this morning, we pray. Lord, let that anointing of the Holy Ghost that destroys the yoke, Lord, be so powerful and evident in our life. God, in the small things and in the great things. God, use us, we pray, Lord, as the salt of this earth and the light of the world. Hallelujah. Lord, not of ourselves, God, not by trying to live right, God, but by being Christ in the flesh. Hallelujah. Lord, by living our life in Jesus, God, so that men and women can see our life, they can see our attitude, they can see our actions, and they will glorify you and not condemn you and not ridicule you and not mock you and not scorn you and not blaspheme your holy name, God. Lord, your name has been blasphemed over and over and over again because of the foolish errors that we have all committed, Jesus. And God, I pray this morning, God, give us a brand new start, Lord, a fresh touch. On this Sunday morning, Lord, we pray. God, on this February 28th, God, we pray. Oh, Father God, as we begin a brand new month tomorrow, Lord, the month of March, Jesus, I pray that we will march. I pray that we will march to the drumbeat of Christ. I pray that we will go forward, God, with a renewing of power and a renewing of, Lord, labors of love. Hallelujah. A renewing of a, an awareness of your presence with us, God. Not just a head knowledge, but God, a real awareness in our spirit that God goes with us. Wherever we go, Lord, whoever we're with, we are representing Christ. Glory to God to that person. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord. God, we're believing you for great and powerful things. We're believing you for miracles, signs, and wonders confirming the preaching of your word, God. Lord, we will not bow to the gods of this world, little G. We will not bow to the officials of this world, God, that, that hate you and that reject you and that try to silence the church, that try to shut down the gospel of Jesus Christ. For there is no name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. Amen. And so, Lord, today, thank you. Lord, I just speak as, as one of the pastors of this church, one of the leaders of this church. I speak blessings now, God. Hallelujah. The Lord bless thee. The Lord keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. And the Lord give you peace. Glory to God. Oh, the Lord give you peace today that passes all understanding. Supernatural joy, supernatural peace, and an abundance of love. Oh, hallelujah. That covers a multitude of sins. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. Thank you so much for coming today. It's been wonderful. And we're going to just keep on together going forward. Hallelujah. Let's continue to listen to me before we, before we stop. Let's continue to stay in contact with one another. I appreciate the great job that you're doing. I really do. You know, texting one another, phone calls, you know, and, and, and just words of encouragement, letters, cards, whatever, emails, however we do it. Because it's not some kind of a program. You know, how many phone calls did you make? How many cards did you send out? It doesn't go like that. It's like the Holy Spirit says, by the way, so-and-so needs some encouragement. And then you act on that. Hallelujah. And, 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 and by doing that, we are going to go through this. As somebody said earlier, I forget who it was. But we're going to go through this, praise the Lord. And we're coming out on the other side in victory and blessing and an and abundance of greater things to come. Hallelujah. Before Jesus comes in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.